In this talk talk, we are presenting explicit neuraminogen graphs of every degree, a paper by Sedant Mohanty, Ryan O'Donnell, and Pedro Perej. Throughout the talk, we'll concern ourselves with unrected graphs that are deregular for some constant t. In particular, we'll study spectral properties of their JCC matrices. But before we get to our results, let's put them into context. Loosely speaking, expander graphs are sparse graphs in which every small set of vertices has many edges on its boundary. Graphs with this property have been studied since the 70s, and since then multiple applications and connections have been found to various parts of computer science and mathematics. A good way to quantify this notion of expansion is through eigenvalues of the JCC matrix. Recall we are working with undirected graphs, which means the JCC matrix is symmetric, and its eigenvalues are all real. So we can order these and denote them by lambda 1 through n. For the regular graphs, we also know that the largest eigenvalue, lambda 1, known as a trivial eigenvalue, is equal to d. The extent to which d regular graphs are expanding is governed by the magnitude of their non-trivial eigenvalues. So we can define a spectral expansion by the maximum between the second largest and the negative of the smallest eigenvalue. Below we can see how the spectrum looks like using this notation. The well-known alain bopin bound shows that 2 square root d minus 1 is essentially a lower bound of the spectral expansion. We'll shed some light on the seemingly magical value of 2 square root d minus 1 later. We define Ramanujan graphs as graphs that are essentially optimal, meaning that they meet the spectral lower bound. Given this, we can ask the following question. Can we find infinite families of Ramanujan graphs of all degrees? That is, that is a sequence of Ramanujan graphs of a given degree with increasing number of vertices. Our results bring us closer to its answer. Let's look at the different answers given by prior work. If we're satisfied with d minus 1 prime, where d is the degree of the graph we're constructing, then Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak, and independently Margulies, proved that the answer is yes in 88. Later, Morgan's term improved this result to all d such that d minus 1 is a prime power. In a sequence of works, started by Marcus, Spielman, and Srivastava, and culminating the result by Cohen, it was recently shown that the answer is yes for one-sided Ramanujan graphs. This is graphs where we only bound the second largest eigenvalue. Finally, it was first conjectured by Alon, proved by Friedman, and then simplified by Bordenov that uniformly random irregular graphs are near Ramanujan with high probability. This means they're epsilon close to Ramanujan. So the answer is yes if we allow randomness are, and are satisfied by near ramanujan -ness. Our result is essentially a deterministic version of this. We show the following. For all constant d greater than 2 and epsilon greater than 0, there is a deterministic algorithm, and the determinism is key here, that produces a graph g on theta n vertices in poly n time, whose spectral expansion is bounded by 2 square root d minus 1 plus epsilon. This is the new ramanujan we talked about. Our result is not strongly explicit, but it is probabilistically strongly explicit. We want to find or delve deeper into what this means in this talk. We'll refer you to our paper for more information on this. This is a very broad sketch of our construction. In short, there are two phases. In phase A, we construct an initial small graph with low spectral expansion. In phase B, we apply a procedure called lifting, which doubles the size of the graph while maintaining low spectral expansion. And we'll repeat this until we get a graph with the desired number of vertices. The main contribution of our work is in phase B. But before we delve into that, we'll first say some words about how phase A works. Recall the result proved by Friedman and simplified by Bordenov, which says uniformly random irregular graphs are near Ramanujan with high probability. Using standard deramanization tools, we weakly derandomize this meaning we obtain a quasi-polynomial time algorithm that produces a near Ramanujan graph. Additionally, the produced graph has essentially a sparse small cycles. Namely, it is bicycle-free at radius something like log n. Bicycle freeness as radius r means that every radius r vertex neighborhood in G has at most one cycle. A graph having this property is locally tree-like, meaning it is very close to a tree in small neighborhoods of vertices. This is a key aspect we'll leverage in phase B of our construction. We'll skip the full technical statement of our construction of phase A, but in short, this weak de allows us to construct, in polynomial time, a de graph G0 
on some small number of vertices n naught, such that the graph is bicyclic free at radius omega log n naught, and such that the spectral expansion is a desire, namely 2 square root t minus 1 plus epsilon. We can do this for n naught equals 2 to the O of square root log n. The goal of phase b is to boost this small graph into the full size graph, the same spectral expansion. Let us now turn our attention to that. To delve into phase b of our construction, we first introduce the notion of a two lift. A two lift is a method of obtaining a graph h from another graph g, where h has twice the number of vertices of g, and h also preserves some nice properties that g might have. So uh, let's get started with the definition of a two lift. So uh, in the two lift of a graph, you take every vertex and you replace that vertex with two copies. So as you can see in this picture, the two vertices A, B were each replaced with two copies of A, A1 and A2 and two copies of B, B1 and B2. And wherever there is an edge in the original graph, uh, we place a matching. And uh, as you can see in this picture, there's a total of two possible ways to lift an edge B. You start by duplicating A, you get A1, A2, then you duplicate B, you get B1 and B2. And there's two possible lifts we can do. There's a plus lift, which uh, places two parallel edges between the duplicated copies, namely A1, B1, A2, B2. And then there is the a minus lift, which places two crossing edges. Namely, you have an edge going from A1 to B2, and you have an edge going from A2 to B1. So just to illustrate another example of a two lift, consider the a graph, which is a length two path, and one of the edges is labeled with a minus, the other edge is labeled with a plus. Now, if we do the minus lift on the vertical edge and the plus lift on the horizontal edge, you end up with the graph on the right. Okay, so now let's recap our plan. So our first step was to start with this graph G0 that we obtained from phase A of our construction. And recall that G0 was, first of all, a near dominant graph. Second of all, it was bicycle free at a certain appropriate radius. Uh, and third, Okay, G0 had two to the power square root log n vertices. So keep in mind that it wasn't the full n size graph that we wanted, but G0 is still a pretty big graph. And this you should sort of think of as the seed for phase B. Okay, now the first step of phase B would be to try to find a two lift of G0 that is near Ramanujan. And we're going to call this two lift of G0 uh, as G1. So uh, now once we successfully find a near Ramanujan two lift of G0, we actually have a graph on two times two to the root log n vertices. So the natural strategy to get a graph on n vertices is to just keep going. That is, okay, you lifted G0 to G1. Now you want to lift G1 to like an even bigger graph G2 and iteratively perform this procedure log n times until we are left with an, uh, a graph on theta n vertices, which is GT. And at every step, we want the lift that we find to actually be Ramanujan. And uh, the key result in our paper is a polynomial time algorithm to find such a good two lift. Okay, now since we want our two lifted graph to be near Ramanujan, we mathematically need some way of obtaining a handle on the spectrum of the lifted graph. Uh, and fortunately, such a handle does exist. So let's see, start with some graph, which is labeled as original graph in the slide. And uh, this original graph has a decency matrix A0. Now you place uh, an edge signing on this graph. And like you can see, some, some of the edges are labeled plus, some are labeled minus. And you perform a, a two lift according to the signing. And you end up with this lifted graph. 
which um, is a graph on the left of the slide, um, know that this graph has two duplicates of every vertex. One is marked in yellow, the other is marked in red. And this graph has, we call it adjacency matrix A. So the nice thing about the spectrum of A is that it decomposes into the spectrum of A0, namely the spectrum of the base graph, and eigenvalues of AS. So in particular, A has a bunch of old eigenvalues which come from the base graph, and it has a bunch of new eigenvalues which come from the sign graph. Thus, uh, our task of finding a good two lift is equivalent to finding a signing of the graph such that all its eigenvalues are as small as possible. In other words, we want to find a near Ramanujan signing of uh, the base graph G0. OK, so now our first attempt is going to be, let's understand what happens if we take a graph G0 and randomly sign all of its edges. And indeed, we're able to show that with high probability, a random signing does give us uh, a matrix with eigenvalues sufficiently bounded, where sufficiently bounded means they're all at most two times square root d minus one plus little of one. As long as this graph has a high enough bicycle free radius. So as you can see, the bicycle free radius we need is like this number log log n to the four. But if you recall, the graph that we got from phase A actually has a significantly bigger bicycle free radius. So indeed, if we were to randomly sign uh, the graph that we got from phase A, we would end up with a two lift that is also a near Ramanujan graph. OK, but uh, at the end of the day, we care about getting a deterministic algorithm. So this random signing thing, it's encouragement, but it's not yet clear how one gets a deterministic algorithm out of this. Uh, but actually, we are able to show something stronger. In particular, this assumption that GS is a random edge signing can be relaxed. So currently, as stated, this random edge signing is being sampled uniformly from the space of all signings. For every edge, you're independently flipping a coin. If it's head, you're putting a plus. If it's tails, you're putting a minus. But really, you don't need to do that. It suffices for the random signs to be pseudo-random. So uh, I won't discuss specifically what pseudo-random means in this context. But uh, the important thing to note is that uh, this pseudo-random string can actually be produced from a seed of ordered logarithmic and n bits. And because of that, uh, it's actually possible for us to brute force search over the space of all possible pseudo-random strings that our PRG could have given us, and check for each one of them whether the lift produced is Ramanujan or not. Uh, and since there's only polynomially many strings to check, and since uh, the theorem on the previous slide holds for pseudo-random strings too, we will certainly find one whose largest absolute eigenvalue and magnitude is bounded by the number that we want to bound it by. So now I would like to go back and say a few things about how we prove this statement about the spectrum of a randomly signed deregular graph that's, appro that's appropriately bicycle free. Our main technique for doing this is going to be the trace method, uh, which is a pretty common technique in bounding the spectral norm of matrices. So the first observation uh, in hand is that, let's say you take some symmetric matrix A and you raise it to some large power T. Its trace is going to be the sum of the teeth power of its eigenvalues. And if we choose T to be an even number, since eigenvalues are that of a symmetric matrix and are real, uh, actually, this trace is now going to be a sum of n positive numbers. That is, each lambda i to the t is going to be positive. 
okay so the sum of t positive number of n positive numbers is at least the maximum of these positive numbers which is recorded in the inequality trace of a to the power t is at least lambda 1 to the power t and actually the trace of a to the power t is at most if uh, you replaced every summand with the maximum so the trace of a to the power t is going to be at most n times lambda 1 to the power t and with these two inequalities in hand we actually know that if we take this trace quantity and then raise it to the power 1 over t you actually get a very good approximation of lambda 1 if you choose t to be appropriately large namely this quantity is sandwiched between the maximum margin value and uh, just a small number which is n to the power 1 over t times the maximum margin value and by choosing t large enough you can make n to the power 1 over t as small as you want so at this point our whole game is in obtaining a very good understanding of trace of a to the power t so now let's imagine a is the adjacency matrix of the randomly signed graph uh, with some combinatorics you can conclude that the diagonal entries of a to the power t actually contain the total weight of length t closed box uh, from a respective vertex back to itself so now if you take the trace of this matrix and this time instead of using the definition of trace being sum of eigen values we use the definition that it's the sum of the diagonal entries the result you get is that the trace of a to the power t is actually the total weight of all closed box in this graph and um we have a a counting argument which sort of follows the counting argument of bordenoff's proof of friedman theorem and from that we are able to obtain desired bounds on the trace so actually like you a little bit we don't actually count closed box within the graph but instead only consider closed non backtracking box but we're going to ignore that for the sake of today's discussion the final thing i want to address is where is this number 2 times square root d minus 1 coming from it may seem like a rather mysterious number but it seems like okay it's a lower bound on what your special expansion can be uh but also it seems like this is what random graphs achieve and this is like the best achievable so one question is like why does it come up and there is actually a very natural answer uh the number 2 square d minus 1 comes up rather naturally when you're counting closed box in the deregular infinite tree so here i've illustrated this particular infinite graph or like a finite piece of this particular infinite graph which is you have a root and then the root has d neighbors and then as you go out every vertex has d minus 1 children and actually the number of closed box of length t from x to x is on the order of magnitude this magic number 2 times square d minus 1 holds the power t to conclude let's review our result we showed that for all constant t greater than 2 and epsilon greater than 0 there is a deterministic algorithm that produces a graph g on theta n vertices in poly n time whose spectral expansion is bounded by 2 square root t minus 1 plus epsilon. Our construction is based on a two-phase method. The first one produces a small graph by weakly de-randomizing a known result that says that uniformly random deregular graphs are near Ramanujan. The second phase uses two lifts and properties about small cycles to boost the number of vertices to the desired one while keeping the target spectral expansion. Thanks for listening.